Okay, I think uh, I think we're all in. Um, I want to say uh, welcome to everybody. I'm sorry if anybody got confused because of the reminder email being a different time than uh, you know what was posted on the invitation. We have our board meeting before this presentation, which started at six, so that's what caused the confusion. But I'm glad that uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm glad that almost everybody uh, you know. Uh, came in at seven and, and, and wasn't burdened by it. So uh, by the way, um, my name is uh, Richard Moses and I am the president of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. And we're a not-for-profit group uh, formed in 2007, dedicated to the preservation of the historic Lower East Side, which includes the East Village, Lower East Side below Houston Street, Chinatown, Little Italy and the Bowery. So uh, I now am very happy to introduce uh, Marsha Haddad Economopoulos, uh, who is uh, my fellow board member. I should say our fellow board members because we have uh, several Lesby board members here with us tonight. And also the museum director at Kahila Kadosha Yanina, uh, which is a beautiful historic uh, synagogue, a Greek synagogue on uh, on Broom Street in the Lower East Side. So uh, let's uh, let's welcome Marsha. Okay, I'd like to give a shout out to Anita Altman uh, from our community and Joel Negra. And I saw you somewhere, Joel, under your wife's name. But um, it's always good to see people from our community coming out and being active in this. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen. If that's okay with everybody. Okay, this was a chore, I just wanna say from the beginning, to tie in Greek and US independence and then somehow bring it back to the Lower East Side. Thank you, Richard, for that. <laughs> Glad that I could be of help here. <laughs> okay, um, to start with, I'm going to give you some, uh, what I consider creative interpretations of history. Now, first of all, the word history comes from the Greek, historia, which means story. And basically it depends who's telling the story and it's usually the victors that tell the story. Uh, in these two histories of independence, both the US and the Greek, we'll find that what they put out there wasn't necessarily the truth. So much had to do with nation building. You know, give some thought of how, what makes a nation, what makes it different from the surrounding nations around them. Language is of course important. Every nation chooses a, an anthem, a flag. They also choose the highlights of their history. They highlight the positive and downplay the negative. And then there's the distinguishing aspects of a culture that makes them different from their surrounding neighbors. Let's start with um, national anthem. We all know, oh say can you see by the dawn's early light, that's what we sing. How many of you are aware of the second chorus where it talks about no refuge could save the hireling and the slave? This has become a problem recently because obviously the early United States where we talk about equality, liberty, it only was from a very small group of people. It was from male white landowners. And it would only be later on that the vote would be extended to other groups. And we're still running into problems here. Okay, let's get back July 4th. That's the day that we celebrate independence. Even though this wasn't the day the Continental Congress decided to declare independence, which was actually July 2nd or the day the American Revolution started, which was in April of 1775, or the date on which the declaration was delivered to Great Britain in November of 1776, or the date it was signed, August 2nd, 1776. So much, much of this had to do with the War of 1812. Now we know from the War of 1812, that's where we got our anthem. And also they put out 
the, a republication of the Declaration of Independence. And on the top, they put July 4th, 1776, even though that wasn't the date, but that now became the date for celebration, which actually this was not made a national holiday until the 19th century. What were the causes of the War of Independence? There was the Seven Year War, which uh, preceded it, taxes and duties, Boston Massacre, Boston Tea Party, the Intolerable Acts, King George III's speech to Parliament. You know, I was listening to a replay of uh, Hamilton and um, King George has a very colorful part in Hamilton. In addition to vastly increasing Britain's land in North America, the Seven Years' War changed economic, political, and social relations between Britain and its colonies. It plunged Britain into debt, nearly doubling the national debt. Now, who was going to pay this debt? The colonies, of course. The Boston Massacre was a confrontation on March 5th, 1770, in which British soldiers shot and killed several people, five, by the way, so it really was not a massacre by any means. But the event was heavily publicized by leading patriots, such as Paul Revere and Samuel Adams. So you see, fake news is quite old. The Boston Tea Party was a political protest that occurred on December 16th, 1773 at Griffin's Wharf in Boston, Massachusetts. American colonists, frustrated and angry at Britain for imposing taxation without representation, dumped 342 chests of tea imported by the British East India Company into the harbor. So the Tea Party was preceded by a couple of centuries. The Intolerable Acts were a series of laws passed by the British Parliament in seven, the mid-1770s. The British instated the acts to make an example of the colonies after the Boston Tea Party, and the outrage they caused became the major push that led to the outbreak of the American Revolution in 1775, not 1776. On October 26, 1775, King George speaks before the House of the British Parliament to discuss growing concern about the rebellion in America, which he viewed as a traitorous action against himself and Great Britain. A traitor is everyone who does not agree with me. Sound familiar? Okay. <laughs> now, a traitorous act, how is this to be pun punished? Men found guilty of treason by Great Britain was sentenced to be drawn to the place of execution on a hurdle, hanged, cut down while still alive, and then disemboweled, castrated, beheaded, and quartered. So it was really a very serious punishment. Interesting, uh, before 1790, the most popular form of punishment was burning at the stake, but I guess they didn't feel that that was cruel enough. Who were the heroes of the American Revolution? There were a number of men and women that rose to prominence, of course, George Washington, Abigail Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Patrick Henry, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and countless others distinguished themselves by their courage, patriotism, wisdom, and talent. You know, I had a teacher in junior high school that really turned me on to history. It was in a social studies class, and most of the students were so bored about having to study American history. And he said to us something I'll never forget. Remember, you're talking about people. Dig up the dirt. So we went out to find out all the scandals about these people. And of course, George Washington grew marijuana on his plantation. He slept all over the place, not necessarily with his wife. So he was quite a colorful figure, uh, as was Benjamin Franklin. And as we know now, as was Thomas Jefferson had slaves, most of them had slaves. So these were the heroes of the American Revolution. The myths of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, of course, are the first 10, um, the, the 10, I'm looking for my word here. Okay, amendments to the Constitution. The Constitution original did not have any amendments. Interesting, the first amendment was freedom of religion speech and the press. Remember the religion part. 
The second, and the Congress shall make no law expe respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free, uh, free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the uh, peaceful assembly and to petition the, petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, there's been always misinterpretation of this. People have interpreted to their own motivations, their own mission, but probably no amendment has been more frequently misinterpreted than the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. A well-regulated militia, militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They forget the first part of the amendment. The right to bear arms had to do with forming a militia. My feeling is, and I'm going to get a little political here. I'm sorry, but I have to. <clears throat> Anyone who wants free right to bear arms, I feel we should just give them a musket. <clears throat> okay, the Greek War of Independence, I need to. Let's see how different <clears throat> the Greek War of Independence, which uh, the anniversary is 1821. Again, the Greek revolt was precipitated on March 25th. This is the standard statement when we talk about when the, the Greek War of Independence started. Bishop Germanos Apatris raised the flag of the revolution over the monastery of Agia Lavra in the Peloponnese. The cry, freedom or death, became the motto of the revolution. March 25th is a religious holiday in Greece. It's the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary. Forget everything I just said. March 13th, 1821, was when Germanos, the uh, Patris, the um, uh, Metropolitan Bishop there, raised the flag. Not March 25th. March 13th is the day given by historians for the event. Yet Greeks chose March 25th as the historical day of the beginning of the war in earnest so that the outbreak of the revolution coincided with the Feast of the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary. So where the uh, July 4th might have been a misinterpretation of the events, March 25th was a actual reinterpretation of the events for their own purpose of making this coincide with a religious holiday. Who fought the Greek War of Independence? Most of the fighters were known as cleftors, thieves, bandits in the mountains. Those were the ones who fought. It was a guerrilla warfare. This is Kolokotronis and Makarianis, two of the most famous of the fighters. Makarianis is, is a very interesting individual. People talk about him and the, what he wrote. He was actually illiterate and he didn't write anything by himself, but yet his words have come down as if they were written by him. There were also many Greek heroines. Bubalina, those of you who saw Zorba the Greek remember Bubalina, well, she was quite a different character in actual history. She came from the island of Spetsis. She was a, a wealthy woman, independently wealthy in her own right, and gathered together a fleet of ships to fight in the war. Then there was Mavrogenis. Anyone who goes to Mykonos will see her statue in the main square there also an example of an independently wealthy woman. Now, the last woman here, Damni, she uh, was a little different. She came from a remote part of Greece, up in Thraki, and um, made her way actually into a fighting position in the military, rather than this, the supplier of, um, of ships. Hellenism or well, the sense of Greek nationality has long been fostered by the Greek Orthodox Church. This is a fact. If it was not for the Greek Orthodox Church, Hellenism would never have survived. Envision us in this country. Now, Greece was under the um, Ottoman Turks, or the politically correct expression for Greeks, the yoke of Ottoman oppression. Uh, for over 400 years, in some instances close to 500 years, such as in Yanagar and Salonika. But um, picture the United States. Picture if we had a foreign power come in here. How long would it take for us to be speaking their language, practicing their religion? Probably a generation or two. 
And yet, because of the Greek Orthodox Church, fostering, preserving the language, preserving the ethnic of, of what Greek is, what it's all about, they really held out their identity throughout the whole occupation. And the church was very instrumental in, in being a, a center of the rebellion. In 1843, um, now Greece did not have a constitution until 1843. Greek War of Independence, 1821 through 1826, no constitution. Why? It was because of the great powers, and I'm going to talk about them a little later. The great powers were France, Germany, and Russia. Uh, they decided that uh, the Greeks weren't capable of governing themselves. So after the War of Independence was won, they appointed a barbarian uh, no nobility. It was Otto of Bavaria, who became the first king of Greece. And Greece has never had a native-born king. It's always been from the Bavarian Empire. It couldn't be one of the major powers. They also didn't think the constitution, they were ready for a constitution, but finally they were given a constitution in 1843. The Greek national anthem, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm losing half of my screen here because of this, but the words are talk about blood, the fight, the deaths, and the fact that it was the Greeks of old that brought them they, they rely back on their ancient history and the heroes in their ancient history. So it's very different from the US national anthem, which really uh, revolved around a fight. It revolved, revolved around the war of 1812 and an actual battle that was witnessed and the flag flying overhead. In Greece, they go back centuries. The national anthem was composed by a man by the name of Dionysius Salamos who was actually not fluent in Greek. His um, preferred language was Italian. He came from the island of Zakynthos, which was uh, under the Italians for a long period of time. And um, he struggled with Greek as a language, but he composed the national anthem and did a beautiful job. Okay, flags tell their own story. The Greek flag prominently displays the crucifix. It brings the religious religion into the flag, while the United States flag displays the colonies and as they changed and the 13 strikes. Now, how did the American Revolution influence Greek independence? Why didn't Greece, a better question, why didn't Greece go back to nationalistic revolutions that were taking place on European soil, especially the French Revolution? Greece actually felt more comfortable looking at the American Revolution. They found it an inspiration to en enslave Greeks, not only during the actual days of the Revolutionary War, but long after its successful completion and eventual declaration of independence and the creation of the United States of America. The rise of nationalism and the great powers all concerned, they were all concerned with their own interests. Uh, Russia, Britain and France all had their own motives for supporting or not supporting Greek independence. Britain and France were afraid that the Ottoman, if the Ottoman Empire fell, Russia would step in and gain control of the Black Sea and the Bosphorus Straits. As you can see, the Black Sea bordered on many, many countries, not only Turkey, but also Bulgaria, the Ukraine, Romania, Russia. And the Bosphorus Straits was a major, it was like the Suez Canal to go from one side of the, of, of the Bosphorus to the other. So Britain and France were afraid that if the Ottoman Empire fell, Russia would step in and gain control of the Black Sea and the Bosphorus Straits. The Russians did not initially support Greece, fearing that this long rebellion would be a threat to their own empire. But when the Greeks defeated the Ottoman Turks with the help of the great powers, the great powers rejected the concept of Greece governing itself and installed a barbarian king. This is a picture of uh, Otto here. 
some of his costumes were really quite comical. He never learned to speak Greece. But by the way, this is where Prince Philip gets his connection, his lineage to Greece, because uh, his mother, Alice, was a direct descendant of uh, the family of Otto and th that lineage there. Okay. The Greek Revolution rang, the bells of freedom rang in 1821, and the, um, it was freedom or death, resignated. The American Philhellene started lobbying campaigns in the United States, a campaign that captured the, the support of many influential political and, uh, and uh, literary figures. Some of the most prominent ones was Daniel Webster here, who gave an impassioned speech to, for support for the Greeks, James Monroe and John Quincy Adams. James Monroe spoke a number of times because it was during his presidency that the revolution took place. He spoke a number of times about not only moral support, but also financial support. But because of the Monroe Doctrine, ironically, which precluded um, helping any countries outside of uh, North America and Central America, um, money was not given. The Greeks, on the other hand, knew from the beginning that their uh, war of independence, that the American people would understand their struggle, having themselves recently experienced a similar struggle. And they sought to influence the um, Americans to side with the Greeks. Your virtues, Americans, are close to ours. Although a broad sea separates us, wrote Mavro Mikalis. We feel you closer than our neighboring countries and we consider you friends, co-patriots and brothers because you are fair, philanthropic and brave. Um, do not hesitate to help us. The first volunteer American to travel and join the Greek War of Independence was Javis, a New Yorker who went to Greece, learned the Greek language, put on a Ustinella, the Greek kilted skirt, and upon joining the Greek guerrilla fighters, he became known as Capitan Zervos. Jarvis was brave, he participated in many battles, and um, he repeatedly was wounded and died of natural causes in Argos on August 11th. His appeal back home for aid and contributions for Greek causes paid off. An interesting figure that also went to fight in the Greek War of Independence was Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe. He was a Boston uh, physician. He established a medical center in Agena, a school for the blind in Corinth. And long after the revolution, he continued to be active in Greek affairs. He went back in 1866 during the Cretan re uh, Revolution and returned to Greece with his wife to organize support for the new uprising. Where do we fit in? Where does Kehila Kadoshiyan in the fit into this? Obviously, we were not around at the time of the American Revolution, nor the Greek uh, uh, Revolution for Independence. So where do we fit into this picture? Well, this community feels itself to be very Greek. This is a prime example here. Sitting at the head of the table is the Archbishop uh, Athena Gordis, and right alongside of him is uh, the rabbi, Jesula Levy. If you look through these photos, you would not be able to distinguish who is Greek Orthodox and who is Greek Jewish. Uh, Greek Jews supported any cause that was Greek. Uh, we have still to this day have very close relationships with the uh, Archdiocese in Manhattan. Uh, we are given a private audience with the new archbishop whenever he comes in, and we have continued relationships with the archbishop during his tenure. The same thing goes with the Greek consulate in New York and the Greek embassy in Washington, DC. This is a picture of a bar mitzvah that took place in 1937. Bar mitzvah boy was Irwin Joseph. Joe Joseph was his father, president of the synagogue. Again, we have Athena Gordis at the head of the table in the DS, and this is, um, the uh, Jesula Levi, the rabbi, and alongside him, Rabbi Matzel. How many bar mitzvahs can you go to where you have a Greek flag flying in the background? 
Members of the Yanina community in New York gave philanthropically to Greece during World War II. This is an actual letter that was sent by the Archdiocese thanking um, Joe Joseph, who was the president at that time, who was in the textile industry. He sent over remnants um, to Greece to help clothe the war-stricken people of, of Greece. And he received this uh, beautiful letter from the um, philanthropic organization of the Archdiocese. The Greek parade, uh, every year there are Greek Jews that march in the parade. Um, it's unfortunately for a number of us, it's become a painful anniversary. Uh, Greek Independence Day, March 25th. March 25th was also the day in 1944 where the Jewish community of Yanina, Arta, Prevesa, Trikula Lavis of Volos, Castoria, uh, Athens, um, Katara were all rounded up. So it's a, and they did it purposely to show the Greek people how irrelevant their concept of independence was. But for us, the celebration of Greek Independence Day is tarnished by the memory of what happened in 1944 on that day. Our festival we have annually is a show of how really Greek we are. Um, we have Greek food, Greek music. We uh, love opening up who we are to the neighborhood and watching our neighbors enjoy celebrating with us. There's always dancing. And this year on August 15th, we will be celebrating our return with the Greek Jewish block party. Do join us. You're all welcome. Thank you very much. I'm opening the floor to questions. Are there any questions in the chat room? Uh, I don't think so, not yet. Okay. If anyone has a question, if you want to raise your hand, we'll unmute you. Okay. Uh, you're going to have to unmute yourself, Lorraine. On the top. Oh. Can they unmute themselves, Richard? Or you have yeah, to... no, I didn't have a question. Oh, okay. I don't know what I, 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 I did, but I wasn't okay. going to ask a question. Sorry. Does anyone have a question? Marcia. Uh, oh, there is yes. one. Here's one of those. Oh, Anita. Yes, Anita. Um, a question re regarding uh, enforced. Did the Jewish community actively participate in the military? I mean, 20, 1821 was part of Greece, and then it wasn't until 1912 right. and the Balkan Wars. And I don't know, I had some family myth about, you know, my grandfather coming because he wanted to escape from being impressed into service in the Ottoman army. Is that, does that ring have any resonance? We don't really, we have uh, stories of Greek Jews that somehow aided during the war of independence, especially doctors in the Peloponnese. But we don't have any stories of any of them fighting. Now, of course, you have to realize that Yanina was not part of modern Greece then. Right. Neither was Salonika. And it wasn't until 1912 and 1913 that they would be. Now, Greek Jews participated in all wars that Greece took part in. The Balkan Wars, they fought, um, and at times it could be painful because they may be fighting against relatives that were living in Turkey or Bulgaria. Right. Uh, during World War I, they fought. Uh, obviously, during World War II, they fought. And as far as the conscription into foreign armies, this was, in, in researching my book, I did a lot of research on that particular topic, Anita, because it appeared that so many young men started to come over just close to their 25th birthday. Why their 25th birthday? Because you were able to buy your way out of serving in the Ottoman Turkish uh, army. Uh, they didn't want Greeks to serve, obviously, so Jews became prime subjects to conscript to serve, but you could buy your way out but it got exceedingly expensive by the age of 25. So many of them chose to leave before that point. Uh, as far as um, 
being forced to fight for Greeks. Um, during World War II, it was completely voluntary. There was no conscription into it. And there were Greek Jews proudly fought way above and beyond their proportion to the general population. Because out of a total Jewish population of 76,000, there were over 13,000 uh, Greek Jewish men that fought. And many gave their lives too, and their limbs. Um, but what pained me afterwards, after the war was over and the Greek Civil War, where they were constricted to fight in the Greek Civil War by the government, and very often the government was not the ones that saved them, it was the, exactly, the resistance, that's right, the army last that saved them. And uh, so that was a painful period there. Great question, Anita, and it's so good seeing you, by the I way. I know, honey. <laughs> so we have one question uh, from uh, Fran. Uh, did the Greek Orthodox Church incorporate the rich and colorful Greek mythology in its effort to maintain <laughs> Greek culture? Uh, actually, the Greek mythology was considered blasphemy. Um, but um, what happened in modern times, you'll find children named Athena, uh, Pericles, you'll find them holding many uh, non, most of the names are from saints, but obviously there's no Saint Athena, and yet there are many young girls who hold that name. They, um, the, uh, initially, with the foundation of the Greek Orthodox Church, okay, uh, I, I don't know what happened here. Okay. Barry, did you just share the screen? I don't know. Um, I don't know who. What's coming that. up? It's it's about the sick I, of the forty minute limit. Yeah, that's what I see. Oh okay. boy. Okay, I did have a question though, Marsha. No, we don't have a forty minute limit, so that's okay. Over. I don't know how this got up here. I don't know. And I, I don't, don't know. Get rid of it. That's not me. That's not me. Okay. Okay. Oh, let me just finish answering oh, uh, sure. the question. Sure, the please. question there with mythology. Um, actually, if it was so not name the, is on top. Excuse me? It says Barry Feldman on top. That is him. I did what? We don't know what to do, Barry. Yeah, we don't know. I think we should just continue. I don't see, oh, it's, yeah, it says my name on top. Can you put, click but the stop I, share, you know? Hit the stop share. Oh, okay. now we're back. There you okay, go. Okay, we're back. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, getting back to mythology in the Greek Orthodox Church, um, of course, the Greek Orthodox Church itself was completely opposed to mythology, worship of, of ancient gods. But if it was not for the Byzantine Empire, which really was the Eastern Roman Empire, which was where uh, Byzantium grew, if it wasn't for the Byzantine Empire, we would never have had the Renaissance because they became the repository of both the ancient Greek and the ancient Roman civilization. So it was a mixed bag there as far as mythology was concerned. Um, someone, you had a question, Barry? Yes, I did. I'm wondering, uh, <clears throat> were there uh, Greek Jews participating throughout, throughout history, in, certainly since independence, in government, in Greek government? Um, yes, in certain areas. Uh, Salonika especially, there were many Greek Jews that held positions in the local government not the national government, the local government. And we now have, of course, Moses Elias Orfanyaner, who's the first Jewish mayor ever elected uh, in Greece. But um, they held uh, not uh, nationally, you know, it, okay, first place, they were not part of Greece until 1912, 1913. You have to realize that these major centers of Jewish presence, such as Salonika and Yanina, were not part of Greece until the 20th century. So you're talking about a limited period of time, 1912, 1913. 30 years later, you had World War II and you had the almost complete destruction of the Jewish world in Greece. So there really wasn't the opportunity to serve in, in government. We're hoping now, and in recent history, there have been, especially in Salonika, a number of uh, individuals that have served in the local government there. Here's a question uh, from Robin. Is there a rabbi at the KKJ synagogue uh, today? 
we have a spiritual leader. We don't have a rabbi. Uh, in our tradition, uh, we never had a, we had a very early on, we had paid rabbis. We never paid them enough for they could live without a, a job, but that's actually traditional Judaism. Some of the greatest rabbis in Jewish history, Maimonides, Nachmanides, the Baal Shem Tub, they, uh, they did not make their living from the Torah. They made their living elsewhere and um, they weren't really paid to be rabbis. So we follow that tradition. We don't pay our rabbis. Our spiritual <laughs> leader. <laughs> That's our excuse anyway, Barry. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, question from Michelle. Uh, what is the size of the Jewish Greek population in New York? Okay. Um, you know, we don't have a paid membership, so it's hard to say. We have a newsletter that goes out nationally to about 3,500 households. In most instances, there is a Greek Jewish presence there. Um, and we're a very small minority. You know, when you, when you take in the fact that there are about 6 million Jews in the United States, um, and what is a Greek Jew is the other question, because there was a lot of intermarriage. Um, most of them, after the second, third generation, with very few exceptions, married into a larger world, either the Sephardic world, the Ashkenazi Jewish world, or sometimes also the Christian world. So how do you define yourself? Uh, those people who receive our newsletter find enough seductive about the being Greek Jewish that they define themselves as Greek Jews. But this is a matter, you know, in the world we live in now, we have choices. But so long in, in the history, especially of Jewish people, um, nationality is where you were born. Uh, religion, the religion you were born into. Conversion, especially for Jews, was most of the time out of the question, um, unless they were forced to convert. And then also how many people in mixed marriages, the non-Jewish partner wasn't very profitable for that person to become Jewish. Ethnicity is a recent concept. Now in the world we live in now, we can choose the nation we live in. If we want to move to another country and claim nationality, we can try that. If we want to convert to another religion, we can. Ethnicity is very visceral. And that's the one that we usually rely upon because if you talk to people in our community, they have a very strong visceral reaction to being Greek Jewish. So that speaks volumes in and of itself. Numbers, your guess is as good as mine. I would say probably in all of the United States, pure Roman Yotes, both parents uh, Roman Yote, we have maybe 200, that's all. Israel also has a, a, a population of Greek Jews, but out of their 6 million Jews, maybe 10% are of Greek Jewish background. That's a lot. 6,000? That's 1%. That's 1%. One. That's 1%. <laughs> no, okay, 60,000. You know how many Salonic Leafs are there? There's many, many Salonic Leafs that live there. You, you go into Haifa, you go into Jaffa. You still hear Ladino spoken there. And they have many synagogues. Roman Yoda is completely different. Completely different. I mean, Anita is a prime example. I mean, she came from a very traditional Roman Yoda background. Um, her, but intermarried. <laughs> and then she... The, the, her, no, my mother intermarried. Mother intermarried, <laughs> right. And uh, so that, you know, this, this is what happens. It, it changes. Except I think what's remarkable is that even for those who are half breeds, mm -hmm. there is a sense of profound connection because yeah. of the communities, the intensity of the communities in which we grew up. Because right. I grew up, I'm a Greek Jew. I mean, that's how I, I self-identify. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, Joel Negwin, I where are you, Joel? Okay. Joel is a pure breed. Uh -huh. Both his parents were Roman Yoke. In fact, we have beautiful wedding pictures of the marriage of uh, the Negrin and the Ghani family. And uh, so he's, he's one of the rare entities that's pure. But then he married. He married an Ashkenazi woman. So there we go. 
He married up, as we say. Oh, she's next door. You know I love Linda. You know that. Any other questions or comments? It should be on mute. If if everybody could just double check that you're on mute. If if uh, okay, if you have a question. It's better to be on mute than not be on mute. Um, okay. Uh, we have one last question here in the chat uh, mm -hmm. from Virginia. Where did the current Jews of Greece come from? Okay, according to the oral history of the Jews of Greece, they date their ancestry back to the destruction of the Second Temple, at least the Jews of Yana the Jew. Although the first Jewish presence was in Salonika that goes back uh, 2,300 years ago. And those were Jews that came from North Africa, Alexandria. Most of the Jews in Greece stem from either Sephardic or Roman yoke. The Sephardim, of course, came from the Iberian Peninsula, either Spain or Portugal. There were also Italian Jews that came in after the expulsion of Jews from the south of Italy. So you have a mixture in Greece, um, like you take on the island of Corfu, even the language that's spoken there is a mixture of um, Italian, Apulian Italian, uh, Greek, Spanish and Hebrew. But um, most of the Jews of Greece, the ones that are living there now, have lived on the soil of Greece going back at least before the expulsion from Spain or at the time of the expulsion of Spain. So over 500 years. But then the Roman Jews have been living there for 2,300 years. But those are the two that's, you know, you know, I just had my DNA done again, <laughs> and it's fascinating. I, of course, have a big chunk up in Salonika, because that's where my family came from, the Iberian Peninsula. I can understand Turkey. I can understand Israel. North Africa was enlightening. Somehow, 12% Ashkenazi. How did that happen, Joel? I thought we were more careful. I don't know. <laughs> But I mean, this is the crazy, the crazy things that, you know, Jews move, they go where they find that they can live in peace. And for the most part, on the soil of Greece, whether it was under the classical Greek civilization, the Roman, the Byzantine, Turkish or modern Greece, it was a much more amiable place to live than other parts of the world. There were anti-Jewish laws, but they were never as severe. There were never pogroms. There were spattered instances of blood libel accusations, but it was not the horror that took place in Eastern Europe or the ghettos of Western Europe. It was a whole different existence. So um, that's why I think so many of us identify ourselves with that. We talk to people, Jews who come from an Ashkenazi background. Um, now, Barry, where did your family come from? My family came from uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah. My mother's side came from Poland. My father's side came from Russia. You would not identify yourself as a Russian Jew or a Polish Jew, No, right? no, no. Nor did they. Nor did okay. they. Okay. Where did you come from? They told you where they came from, but they never identified with Russian or Polish nationality. Okay. So that's a very, very different thing, which a lot of people have difficulty understanding. Um, not only Jews, I get a lot from Greek Christians who can't understand the concept of being Jewish and being Greek. They'll say to me, is one parent Jewish, one parent <laughs> Greek, someone convert? And no, I mean, Judaism is a religion. A Greek is a nationality. It's, um, there were Jews all over the world, but we feel strongly about our identity. And um, I think the two examples I have here with Anita and with Joel will agree with me that um, we're proud of who we are. We're very proud of who we are. We feel we have a very distinct culture. Uh, we have great food, much better than Ashkenazi food. How can, <laughs> how can you compare matzo balls and gefilte fish with um, burekas? How can you? You can't, yeah. Anything else? We have one more uh, coming from uh, 
Barrett uh, ab about uh, kosher wine in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Okay, okay, yes, you can get kosher wine in Thessaloniki. Um, the, oh, Chabad, the Chabad there um, okay. provides it. You can also get kosher uzo in Athens. The rabbinate in Athens now puts out a kosher uzo. So there has been uh, a concerted effort to have many foods that traditionally were forbidden to Jews um, because they weren't kosher. I mean, you can always get imported kosher wine from Israel, but the fact that it's now being produced on the soil of Greece is a big initiative. And we have, we have kosher uzo. Yeah. Joanne has a question, I see. Well, yeah. no, it's not a question. I, I was just saying that someone asked about the, uh, the uh, about Dr. Buras, uh, who's the head of Pfizer. And the point that I just was saying was that before the Second World War, his family made kosher wine. In yes, the they did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Um, I, I, I'm very curious to find out if they are still making it, because no. uh, I just think that they're not making it anymore. No, they're not making it. Uh, you know, it, it was, in fact, there was a, um, a beautiful article written by a friend of mine, Leon Sofiel, who researched that. And, um, yeah, you know, what happened, it was a family business for a while. And then um, I think the war interrupted that. And then after the war, it was a matter of moving into other fields. But I always look at, um, at Alberto Berla as a prime example of what the world lost. Because his, he was saved, his family was saved in Salonika, uh, but 97% of the Jewish community in Salonika perished. Think of all the Alberto Berlas that were lost, how they could have contributed to not only Greece, but the world at large. We're having some weird, uh, we're having yeah. some weird uh, interference here. If everyone could just double check their mute. I've been muting people, but uh, everyone could just double check their mute because somebody's. Okay, I um, don't think we have any more questions. No, I, I don't think so. So uh, any last questions, last call for questions? I could be blinking the lights on and off here, but, just double check their mute. but uh, I think, um, I think, well, Marsha, you know, thank you so much for. Uh, for uh, I'm good. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Richard. I'm just going to go make some. I'm just going to go make some dinner for my wife, some uzo and spinach pie. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Joel. And I was still, uh, my thing said unmuted, but I wasn't. Joel, don't forget August fifteenth. We're having a block party. Come down, bring the family. Okay. And if you haven't been to uh, Marsha's synagogue, Kila uh, Kadosha Yanina, which I always mispronounce, I'm sorry. You're doing good. I, I'm sorry, Marsha. I will be in Paris. Marsha, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I will be in Paris. I'm sorry. I can't make it August 15th. Okay. Save it for the spring when we have the big one, okay? I will. If you haven't, if you haven't been to uh, Marsha Synagogue, it's 281 Broom. 280 Broom. 280 Broom Street. Uh, Broom Street is um, right off of Allen Street, just just to the west of Allen Street. Uh, highly recommended. It's a beautiful, beautiful synagogue. Uh, the interiors and the exteriors highly uh, historic, and there's a wonderful uh, exhibit. Uh, on the synagogue and the congregation uh, upstairs, which is uh, Margaret Marsh is, oh, wow. is, is uh, the director of, of the museum there. So I want to thank you again, Marsha, uh, so much. And um, I want to say, uh, last thing is that uh, keep your eyes open for future Lesby events. We uh, are expecting to have a walking tour, a virtual walking tour of Chinatown coming up around the end of the month and also a uh, program on Grace Church on Broadway, which is one of my favorite churches architecturally in the city. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's worth checking out. So that's uh, coming up, I think, on August 4th, right, Carolyn? Yeah, that's, that's coming up on August 4th. So 
Uh, if you can uh, make a donation to Lesby Lower East Side uh, Preservation Initiative, it'd be very much appreciated. Uh, we, we, you know, we need funding to keep these programs going and do our advocacy work for uh, landmarking on the Lower East Side. So if, you, if you'd like to donate, you can go to www.lesby, which is lespi-nyc.org, and a contribution would be very much appreciated. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all uh, next time. And uh, thank you all for coming so much and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.